Hello and welcome to Murder in the UK. Today we're looking at the case of Dale Cregan. Cregan was a drug dealer known as One Eye. Nobody really knew why he'd only got one eye as he'd given so many different reasons over the years. He ended up shooting father and son Mark and David Short, a bit of gangland rivalry. He then called police, making a hoax 999 call, and when two PCs turned up, he shot them both dead, then threw a hand grenade into them to make sure they were dead. He ended up pleading guilty and is held at Ashworth High Security Hospital. What's your thoughts on this case? Please make some comments in the section below. If you want more details, visit www.murderuk.com or keep watching here for a documentary about this case. Thank you very much. At 10.53am on the 18th of September 2012, PCs Fiona Bone and Nicola Hughes were attending what they believed to be a routine act of vandalism at a property in Abbey Gardens, Mottram, Greater Manchester. But instead, they were lured into a deadly trap. Within seconds of arriving at the property, the two unarmed female officers were ambushed by one of Manchester's most wanted men. Dale Cregan fired over 30 rounds in just 31 seconds at the two women and then callously threw a hand grenade at them. This cowardly act deeply impacted the nation and those closest to the victims. Nicola and Fiona stood absolutely no chance. These were police officers, but these were somebody's children. No parent expects to bury their children. And I said to him, said, please, whatever you do, don't tell me she's dead. It's like that massive shock. It's, it's like you, you, everything's just ripped apart. In the summer of 2012, Manchester was on high alert. A dangerous criminal had been on the loose for 40 days. He was armed and deadly. It was 29-year-old Dale Cregan. He was wanted in connection with two gangland murders. He was a man that people were scared of and it became particularly apparent as soon as David Short and, and Mark Short were murdered. There was something quite different about how barbaric they were, knowing that a man had gone into a, a pub, the Cotton Tree, and shot a man. The same in respect of that second murder, we knew quite clearly that it wasn't just a shooting, that a grenade had been involved. And I think when you introduce that kind of weapon, a military weapon being used on the streets in Manchester, is absolutely terrifying. Greater Manchester Police launched Operation Dakar to hunt for the two fugitives, Dale Cregan and his accomplice, Anthony Wilkinson. The team was made up of 60 officers from the major incident room, as well as hundreds of officers across the UK, including the army. PC Fiona Bone and PC Nicola Hughes were police officers in the Greater Manchester Police Force. They were both stationed here at Hyde Police Station. Fiona joined the police in 2007 and served five years in the Tameside Division. Nicola joined in 2009 and had served for three years. Before joining the force, 32-year-old Fiona Bone had travelled the globe with her family. Her father, Paul, was an RAF engineer and was posted all over the world. She was born in Norwich. And just after we, well, she was born, we moved back up to Scotland. Then I got a posting to Bruggen in Germany, and she had three years in Germany, then went back up to Scotland, did an early secondary education in Scotland, and then eventually we moved to the Isle of Man, where she did her... A-levels. Both my daughters sort of acquired friends everywhere, so no matter where we happen to pitch up, she knows somebody, um, or has got to know somebody. Fiona read media studies at university and had had several different jobs, but unsatisfied with her work life, she craved something different. She joined the police as a special for something to do that was more interesting, and she found police life suited her should we say. Ian Hansen, who is now chairman of the Greater Manchester Police Federation, worked directly with Fiona. I did have the pleasure and honour of working with uh, Fiona for some time at uh, Tameside Division. I was actually Fiona's inspector 
when she joined the police and I worked with her for perhaps a period of about six months. Very professional, very bubbly as well. The sort of person you want on a shift. Police shifts are people and we have different characters on shifts and Fiona really did hit the ground running. She was uh, a real pleasure to work with. With her career now fixed, Fiona was planning her wedding to her fiancé Claire the next year. While out on the beat, Fiona's shift partner for that day was 23-year-old Nicola Hughes. I think it's hard to sum up Nicola's life growing up because she was just a normal, everyday child. Obviously, to me, and myself and Nicola's mum, she was special. Really popular with all the school friends and, and family. She left sixth form college and um, went to university, Odessville University, um, studying social sciences, psychology and sociology. At the time, I was working at Wakefield Prison, um, and she came in to visit the psychology department. And on the way home, she said, uh, no, thanks. I don't want to be I don't want to do that. Um, I'm going to join the police. And I've still got a text from Nicola the, the day she was accepted. You, you couldn't measure how excited she was. She was over the moon. Just like her colleague Fiona, life in the police force suited Nicola well and allowed her personality to shine through. I've met virtually every colleague she ever worked with and they all said you know, how enjoyable she was to work with and how much fun she was and how she lit up the room as soon as she walked in and, and how it made, they made you know, the, the shift really positive because of her attitude and her, and her outlook. Now with new careers within the Greater Manchester Police, both PC Fiona Bone and PC Nicola Hughes had promising futures ahead of them. However, one man would shatter the dreams of both women and their loved ones in a matter of seconds. Dale Cregan, born in June 1983 in Manchester, brought up in the east of the city, was a gangster pretty much from birth. He was one of four children and he's been described as quite a sweet looking young boy with quite an angelic face with, with no indication of the, the monster that he'd, he'd go on to become. Um, he wasn't particularly academically able and I think that might have made him the target of, of some bullying during his, his younger years. In 2002, a 19 year old Cregan moved to Tenerife and found work as a plasterer and roofer. It was here that he scammed elderly couples into parting with their cash for timeshares. When he returned to England three years later, he continued with his criminal lifestyle. Dale Cregan was using drugs as well as selling them. And often when we, we've got a situation like this, where somebody is, is using substances, we'll often look at those substances as a way of explaining their behaviour. But we've got to remember that, that many people do take illegal substances, like the ones that Dale Cregan was taking, and they don't go on to become violent or, or go on to kill other people. It was clear that Cregan was quickly making a name for himself as a criminal. He was well known to those in the local area and an incident in Thailand would further add to his notoriety, giving him his most distinguishing feature. Dale Cregan has got a, a, an eye missing, and he, he often replaces that, that eye with an onyx fake eyeball, and that makes him a, a really kind of iconic, quite scary-looking figure. Dale Cregan has never described exactly what happened to his left eye. All sorts of myths have been allowed to grow up about how he lost it. Allegedly, when he was in Thailand, he got involved in a dispute with, with a, a gangster over there who basically taught him a lesson, and Dale Cregan had his eye gouged out by this individual. But again, this is another one of those tales that we need to be incredibly cautious of, um, because it does just sound quite, quite grandiose, doesn't it? All we do know is that the loss of his left eye increased his reputation as a legendary hard man in Manchester. After losing his eye, Cregan returned to his native Manchester. Back on home turf, he was determined to make a reputation for himself. After years of feuding, a drunken pub fight would be the catalyst for a double assassination of two rival gang members and the brutal murder of two unarmed policewomen. By September 2012, PC Fiona Bone and PC Nicola Hughes had established themselves as rising stars in their division of Greater Manchester Police. But their lives were about to be brutally ended as a consequence of Dale Cregan becoming involved in a local gangland dispute. 
So there was a long-running feud between two quite notorious Manchester families and it all came to a head in relation to, to a, a football match, a, a football championship where Man City came out on top and Man United lost out. And a broken bottle was involved and blood was spilled essentially and threats were made. And often when these things are said, they're said in the heat of the moment and you think, well, this is just something that's going to fizzle out, but not when it comes to families like this. Yeah, it certainly got out of hand. The trail of events that, uh, that it left behind uh, was horrific. On the 25th of May 2012, Cregan and two accomplices drove to the Cotton Tree pub in Droylsden, Greater Manchester. And for individuals like Dale Cregan wanting to gain a foothold in the hierarchy of these families and in this criminal underworld, it's an opportunity for him. And he steams in, gets involved in, in this, this altercation and took it upon himself that he was going to be the person who settled this score. At 11.49pm, Dale Cregan, Luke Livesey and Damien Gorman stormed into the Cotton Tree pub. Cregan took out a 9mm Glock pistol and fired seven shots at a group of unarmed men playing pool. Four men were hit. Three survived, leaving one man, 23-year-old Mark Short, dead. Instead of taking down David Short, the patriarch head of a local rival gang, Cregan had actually killed David's son, Mark. This further fueled the rivalry between the two gangs. Cregan, who was the prime suspect, received death threats against his girlfriend and their four-year-old son. He decided to lie low and fled to Thailand shortly after committing the crime. His kind of reputation, I think, was, was cemented at that point. He committed a murder. He'd done something for the family. You know, he was on his way up. CCTV footage outside the pub revealed the getaway car that the men used to escape in after the shootings. Several suspects were arrested for the killing of Mark Short. However, the police wanted to get their key suspect behind bars. On the 12th of June 2012, as Cregan flew in from Thailand, the police arrested him at Manchester Airport. And there was no firm evidence to charge him with the killing of Mark Short, and he was released on police bail. Often when you have um, a, a homicide involving you know, a, a criminal underworld, um, a, a group of people who are in, involved in, in a range of illegal activities, it's very complex. There are, are lots of situations, lots of evidence to, to be processed and, and filtered through. So when you've got very messy investigations like this, it's, it's often very difficult for the police to gather sufficient evidence to, to make a charge stick. After his arrest on the 12th of June, Cregan was released on bail due to insufficient evidence and was free to roam the streets of Manchester again. Instead of keeping his head down and abiding by the law, he saw it as an opportunity to finish what he had started and a way to end the death threats to his family. He was determined to kill David Short. I think that probably had a dramatic impact on Cregan's mind. He has himself said on a number of occasions, I couldn't get him out of my head. And he believed that the only thing he could do was to kill David Short, which he'd failed to do in the Cotton Tree pub. So, along with another, a different accomplice, Cregan goes to Short's house, intent on killing him. Having only just lost his son two and a half months ago, David Short wasn't expecting a visit from the very man who was responsible for Mark's death. But Dale Cregan drove to his house with accomplice Anthony Wilkinson. Cregan pulled out a gun and chased him inside. He pursues David Shaw, shooting as he goes, nine or ten shots, repeatedly. Eventually wounding and then killing Short. And he then puts a hand grenade effectively beneath Short's body and detonates it. Hand grenades had been used in gang warfare before. But this was the first time that one had been used to actually kill someone. It is incredibly unusual for somebody to use a, a hand grenade in, in a homicide. But I think Dale Cregan knew exactly what he was doing there um, in being the first person to commit a murder this way in England and Wales for, for a very long time. That cements that notoriety for him. Hand grenades of this kind have an effect of probably a, a killing range of probably up to about 15 yards and could cause serious injury at much greater distances than that. Uh, quite how it found its way into the country, who can tell? Maybe sold by soldiers, former soldiers. 
Following the violent murder of David Short, Cregan and Wilkinson were driven away by another man, Jermaine Ward. But Cregan wasn't able to cover his tracks this time. Cregan left a bit of a trail of evidence behind him. So after he committed the murder, um, he, he attempted to, to burn a, a car that had been, been used. But he didn't finish it off, essentially, and there was still DNA evidence left in, in that vehicle. With the DNA evidence pointing to Cregan, the police now had enough proof to arrest and charge him. Police were on high alert. I think we knew there was a threat and there were additional resources deployed into, into Manchester. Every officer is trained in, in defensive tactics. So perhaps the most important means of uh, self-defense is uh, their own common sense and communication skills. And that's something which is, uh, is taught them when, when they first join. As well as that, officers have got things like uh, handcuffs, they've got uh, CS spray, they've got a, uh, a baton of some description. The It varies across, uh, across forces as to what people use. A proportion of officers have got tasers, uh, and behind that also there are a proportion of officers on armed patrol. Manchester was a city ready to act. Pictures of Cregan were circulated across the UK, and hundreds of officers were deployed to search for him. His picture was even beamed onto the big screens at football stadiums up and down the country. Detectives carried out over 50 raids and armed police patrolled the areas that Cregan was known to frequent. I noticed an increase in, in officers uh, that, that, that was particularly in the city centre and where you'd see a billboard with Dale Cregan's face, you would see uniformed officers around the city. It was clear this was a priority for Greater Manchester Police. Eventually, on the 17th of September 2012, after nearly a month and a half of being on the run, Cregan reappeared in the very city where he was wanted. He forced himself into the house of a barber he knew. Cregan was aware that the police were closing in on him. Dale Cregan was holed up in a house in, in, in part of Manchester that the police probably wouldn't have been looking for him in. He wanted to have a haircut, he wanted to have a shave for, for when he went into prison, so, so he went to, to the home of a barber and demanded that he, you know, freshen him up, essentially. Cregan decided to spend the night at the barber's and essentially kept the family inside hostage. He had a plan and was preparing to put it into action the following morning. On the 18th of September 2012, at approximately 10.30am, PC Fiona Bone and PC Nicola Hughes were out on duty. They were approximately 20 minutes away from the address of the call-out and they were sent to investigate. No one could have prepared them for what happened next. By mid-September 2012, Manchester's most wanted man, Dale Cregan, had now been on the run from police for 40 days. He'd killed father and son, David and Mark Short, in a rival gang war. Having now returned to Manchester, he was hiding out in a house, preparing for his next move. Not long before 10 o'clock in the morning of Tuesday, September the 18th, 2012, Cregan, using a false name, called Greater Manchester Police and said that a concrete slab had been thrown through the window of the council house he was staying in and that uh, he was fearful for his life. I heard someone just threw a big concrete slab through that window and ran off. Okay, did they, do you know why they'd done it? I haven't got a clue. Okay. Were you in the room where it came through or did you hear the bang? No, I was there? upstairs, I looked out the window and seen one boy running off. Which way have they ran, what direction? Ran there, there's a, like a field at the back and I've just seen him running over the field, I can point it out to the officer. The police control room said, We'll send some officers. And he said, rather chillingly, I'll be waiting. Now, that false call resulted in Nicola and Fiona being deployed to what, on the face of it, appeared to be a routine incident. 32-year-old PC Fiona Bone and 23-year-old PC Nicola Hughes were on a routine patrol in the Mottram district at the time that the bogus 999 call was made. They were deployed to investigate the alleged vandalism. They arrive at the address given to them by Cregan's false call to find a council house with whitewashed windows so could, nobody could see him. Nevertheless, they both get out of the car and walk towards the front door. 
When PC Nicola Hughes and PC Fiona Bone arrived at that address, Dale Cregan came out with a weapon, shot them, and used grenades that he'd used in the past to fatal effect. Nicola and Fiona stood absolutely no chance. It was a brutal murder. It was absolutely barbaric. PC Fiona Bone managed to pull her taser out. She fired, but missed. It's likely that she was shot whilst in the process of doing this. She was hit between five and eight times. Her police radio was also destroyed in the process. Dale Cregan ended his attack on the two officers by throwing a grenade at their bodies. I believe that Dale Cregan used uh, a Glock, a 9mm parabellum calibre Glock pistol in the murders. Uh, I also understand that this was a fully automatic weapon, and by that, I mean that when, when you pull the trigger, it continues to discharge, it continues to fire bullets, until you either release the pressure on the trigger or the magazine is empty. Both officers were wearing body armour, but it couldn't protect them from the carnage that Cregan unleashed. The police body armour is certainly not designed to withstand the effect of hand grenades. I think, given that horrendous scenario, there is very little that anyone could do. Uh, the element of surprise, coupled, of course, with the weapons that he was using. Either of these weapons, the gun or the hand grenades, of themselves, could cause death. And to be confronted with something like that at close range must be absolutely horrific, and I don't think there's anything realistically that the officers could have done. This was a very cold, very calculated, very planned out ambush on, on these two officers. He was trying to achieve status, he was trying to achieve notoriety. And I don't think he would have seen these two officers as individuals. He would have seen them as an institution, the police, part of the establishment. The two officers were critically injured and Dale Cregan fled the scene in a stolen BMW. In a bizarre twist of events, instead of going on the run again, he drove straight here to Hyde Police Station and handed himself in. I think Dale Cregan was very much in control at this point in time, um, and he wanted to be the one calling the shots. So when he's got a, an opportunity to, to seize control of a situation, he, he will do that. And I think handing himself in was very much part and parcel of that. He is an absolute coward. Let's be really clear about that. The police officers who were engaged in the manhunt for him knew precisely what they were dealing with and the threat he posed to police officers and the community. And yes, he could have ended up being shot quite legitimately. And he knew that, so he chose to go straight to a police station and hand himself in. He walked calmly into that station, spoke to the officer at the front desk and he said, I'm wanted by the police and I've just done two coppers. He admitted there and then what he'd done and by then it was becoming clear exactly what had happened, who was involved and who was responsible. He knew that he wouldn't get away with what he'd done in killing two people before murdering two police officers, but this was a man responsible for the murders of four people. The officer on duty immediately recognised Cregan as the man they'd been chasing for 40 days. The officer leapt across the desk at the station and handcuffed him. His superiors were informed that Cregan had been caught. News was spreading across the Greater Manchester Police Force that the man they had all been looking for was now in custody. But there was still one unit that wasn't responding. A flurry of 999 calls came in from neighbours reporting shootings and an explosion in Abbey Gardens. Within minutes, probably seconds of that happening, Nicola and Fiona's colleagues across Greater Manchester were responding to 999 calls and putting their own lives in danger. Officers were sent to the scene, but no one could have prepared them for what they were about to see. It was horrific what happened it was beyond belief it didn't make any sense it was cowardly it was monstrous and that's not what people are like 
What you've got to put into context is, yes, we're police officers, yes, they're professional, they're highly trained, but these are people as well. And what they were presented with when they arrived at that scene, it doesn't get any worse than that. It was horrific. PC Fiona Bone died at the scene, but PC Nicola Hughes was still fighting for life and was rushed to Tameside Hospital. The ambulance arrived at 11.30 a.m. The paramedics and the officers had done all they could, performing CPR and intubating Nicola on the journey. At 11.38 a.m., it became clear there was nothing else they could do. It was about one o'clock and the news headline was two policemen being injured in Manchester. I was driving home from work um, Tuesday, late Tuesday afternoon. Um, I hadn't listened to any news, I hadn't seen any reports of any news. Within 30 seconds of the news headlines being on, there was a knock at the door. And more or less, being in the military, if there was a knock on the door, and we knew she worked in Manchester. And the likelihood of it being her was remote, but as soon as there was a knock on the door, we just invited the two policemen in. And I texted Nicola about something that morning, and I thought, Nicola's not texting me back. Myself and Nicola's mum always called her Nicky New. And I, and I sent her a text, and it must have been about 12 o'clock that day. And I sent her a text saying, uh, we, Nicky New, where are you? And I texted her around about 2 o'clock. Again, still no text from Nicola, no reply. They didn't know if she was dead or injured at the time. And then on the way home, about quarter past two, I had a phone call from unknown number, and it was a, it was a DCI from Greater Manchester Police. And he said, I'm outside your house. Uh, and straight away, it, obviously, alarm bells started ringing. I, I said, why are you outside my house? And thinking back now, I'm thinking, if Nicola had been injured, he'd have said, but he, he, he kept saying, where are you? I'll come and pick you up, I'll come and get you. And I said, well, what's happened, what's happened? And I'd seen Nicola the night before, and she said to me, she, what I thought she said to me, I'm off for five days, but she said, I'm on for five days. And I said, well, it's not Nicola, because she's off work. And he said, unfortunately, it is. People in the, the forces get killed. You expect it. You don't expect people to get killed in the police, right? So I said, well, what's happened to her? She, has she been injured? Has she been she badly injured? And, and, and he kept saying, well, I'll come and get you. And then thinking back, he had said, you know, this. Um, and it, it, what seems like or minutes to and fro in where I'll come and get you and what's happened, tell me what's happened. And I said to him, I said, please, whatever you do, don't tell me she's dead. I remember his exact words, he said, um, there's no easy way of saying this. And how I got home, how I drove home, I've got no idea. The details of the murders were released to the press once the families had been informed. There was significant national media interest in this case. The barbaric nature of those first two murders. And then as two innocent police officers were shot and killed in a gun and grenade attack in Manchester. This just doesn't happen. This was a story that was told not just across the UK but around the world. It captured the attention of a global audience because of how these events have played out. This is a community living amid police tape, police officers, forensics teams. They will move on in the coming days, but this place won't return to normal. What happened here yesterday, the gunfire, the grenade, the deaths of two police officers, will cast a shadow over these streets for a long, long time. Manchester's most wanted man, Dale Cregan, had finally handed himself in after going on the run for 40 days. The impact of his calculated actions were devastating for PC Fiona Bone and PC Nicola Hughes's families and colleagues. Justice had to be served. In September 2012, 32-year-old PC Fiona Bone and 23-year-old PC Nicola Hughes were killed by Greater Manchester's most wanted man, Dale Cregan. He fired 32 shots at the two police women and then threw a hand grenade at their bodies. The nation mourned this horrific attack and the support from the public was overwhelming. 
The funeral for the two policewomen was held over two days from the 3rd of October at Manchester Cathedral. There was officers from everywhere, really, uh, that was replacing Manchester police officers on the streets. The funeral was surreal, really, with the amount of people uh, lying in the streets. And when we were told, oh, we we'll be having the funeral at the cathedral, we said, yeah, you're joking. 30 or 40 people, well, you know, of, you know. And the place was packed, <laughs> um, which was different. Quite hard to understand or even take in at the time. It was really, really strange because to see that many people just there for one reason, um, and they're really upset and you're trying to compose yourself as well. They were two incredibly emotional days. We started to get contacts from police officers around the country offering to come in and cover shifts on those days for Greater Manchester colleagues to free them up to be able to attend the funerals. The communities were horrified by what had happened. This wasn't the people of Greater Manchester. This was something so far removed from what is basically the good people of Manchester. The city came to a standstill, it came together. Just watching officers and members of the public crying, listening to a service to celebrate the lives of two young female police officers. It was, it was absolutely awful. And yet, those families had to celebrate those lives. Horrible events often bring communities together. This brought Greater Manchester together. I think even just to see normal members of the public stood there, um, it was it was strange, but it was so supportive. You sort of like soaked up there. You didn't soak up their grief, but you soaked up their energy that they was given to you, and it, that that helped. I remember standing at the top of Market Street and seeing what looked just like a football crowd walking down towards Dean's Gate. It says it was a sea of police officers dressed in the best uniforms, and they were from all around the UK, in fact, all around the world. Most importantly, that was done for the family. Could you remember that these were police officers, but these were somebody's children, and no parent expects to bury their children. The two police women had been laid to rest. Now, it was time to focus on ensuring Dale Cregan was convicted for his crimes in court. On the 4th of February 2013, Cregan was tried for the murder of PC Fiona Bone and PC Nicola Hughes, and the murders of Mark and David Short. He also stood trial for three counts of attempted murder of the men in the Cotton Tree pub. Nine other men were also in the dock in connection to the murders and attempted murders. Well, this was a very complex trial. There was a lot of evidence to consider. These, these people had very different versions of events. They were all pointing the finger at one another and, and blaming other people. So there was an awful lot for the, the jury to, to pick through, both in terms of hearing the evidence and then going away to think about it. It was here at HMP Manchester where Cregan stayed during his trial at Preston Crown Court. It lasted nearly four months and cost a reported £5 million due to the additional security deployed. Armed police officers were positioned on the roof of the court and surrounding buildings. A convoy including prison vans, cars, motorcycles and even helicopters would transport the prisoners to and from Preston. A total of 120 county police officers were deployed daily. The security was tight and in court, despite all the evidence pointing to Cregan, he pleaded not guilty to all counts of murder. I think that the reason for the, the not guilty plea is essentially about his presentation of self. He wants to maintain and cement that, that notoriety and that, that reputation that, that he's building up. And for that, he needs media exposure. And he's always going to get that if there's, there's a trial. Four days into the trial, Cregan changed his plea to guilty. I think his actions in court showed exactly what sort of a monster we're dealing with. When you consider the hell that Nicola and Fiona's family, friends and colleagues went through from that whole journey, and they're still living it now, he could have spared them some of the pain involved in reliving some of the detail within that trial. 
He chose not to, as he wanted to play it out. He played games in court. Eventually, on the 13th of June 2013, Cregan was found guilty of four counts of murder and three counts of attempted murder. He was sentenced to a whole life tariff by the Honourable Mr Justice Holroyd. Of the nine other men who were on trial, five received sentences between seven and 35 years. Nothing ever will make up for what happened, either for police officers of Greater Manchester, but more importantly, the country owners, friends and family. But it was entirely right that he was given a whole life tariff. That individual should never walk the streets again. Dale Cregan was initially incarcerated in HMP Fort Sutton, but went on hunger strike just two months into his sentence. He was moved to Ashworth Hospital, a high security facility in October 2015, where he will remain for the foreseeable future. I think when we compare Dale Cregan to other individuals who've killed police officers, we've got very, a very different picture. So if we look um, back at the, the gangsters of the 60s, it was, you know, the people versus the establishment. But when we look at, at Dale Cregan, we've got something altogether different because it's something that stood on its own. And, and that makes it, I think, particularly unpalatable for the general public. The immediate response was a call for all police officers to be armed. This was firmly rebuffed by senior figures, such as Home Secretary at the time, Theresa May. Most police officers, in fact, the overwhelming proportion of police officers still don't want to carry a gun. Equally, though, we have to be realistic as to the threat and risk that's presented to police officers and the communities who the officers have to protect. Now, the services responded in recent years by increasing the number of firearm trained officers and increasing the number of armed response vehicles that are out there 24-7 on the streets of Greater Manchester and indeed the whole of the UK. That said, it has to be constantly reviewed and we have to be realistic about the risk that is presented to police officers and our communities. With Cregan now behind bars, justice had been served. But the impact of the murders was felt throughout the force. Fiona and Nicola's colleagues were offered counselling. You have to remember that police officers at the end of the day are people. The people who come to work and wear a uniform. But at the end of the day, the people with families, friends, colleagues. And when something like this happens, it cuts to the very heart. Uh, senior officers, uh, her shift posse seem quite badly affected by, by the death. This affected the police family in Greater Manchester in a way that no event has before. It changed the lives of police officers, of people that worked with Nicola and Fiona. And it changed the lives of the wider police family. I don't think there'll have been a police officer waking up to go to work for Greater Manchester Police, not thinking about what had happened to those two police officers, about what could have happened to them. The legacy of rising stars PC Fiona Bone and PC Nicola Hughes continues. Both families have gone on to create good works in their local community in their honour. Nicola's father Bryn started the PC Nicola Hughes Memorial Fund. It looks to help under 21s who have lost their parents to violent crime, either through education or work. We decided to continue Nicola's legacy with a charity in Nicola's name. I think I'd like to be defined by what I'm doing in Nicola's memory, really, um, and, and the people that were helping, you know, the children that were helping in Nicola's name. And I think if if we help a small number of children get through what we've gone through, it's you know it can be so rewarding, it's unbelievable. A community centre and outreach complex in Sale, Manchester, that cares for the elderly and the vulnerable, was named in Fiona's memory, called Fiona Gardens. There were a number of tributes and memorials that, that took place, one at Hyde Station uh, and also at the scene too. And you listen to the, you know, the, the testimonies from David Cameron and, and the way he spoke about you know, the immense public pride for Nicola and Fiona and, um, and that leaves you feeling really proud but really sad because you're only there for one reason uh, and then to see it unveiled is, was so emotional, it was, it was surreal, it's like you, again you, you've got that experience where you're sat back watching it all. Um, yeah, really difficult times, things like that, really difficult times. We've got every policeman, 
that's been killed in the Manchester GMP area is remembered at Sedgley. Now that, in a way, is what the policemen who worked at that police station wanted, because they had built it themselves, or had it built. And every time I visited, there's usually flowers, and the general public lay flowers there quite frequently, or put small mementos. Thank you for watching. Murder UK is a website dedicated to giving the facts about murders and serial killers within the UK. Please consider subscribing and press that bell icon to be notified when we update new videos. Thank you.